sketches are important to uh, Harris's career, that they they overwhelmingly outnumber the canvases he painted. It's the same for him as it is with, with the other members of the group and Tom Thompson. Uh, but through the conversation, we hope to find out a little bit more about what makes his sketches special um, and, uh, and how Harris used them. So let's start with uh, Algoma sketch uh, from, from around 1920. Uh, and uh, part, just part of what we do is when we get Harris sketches in is uh, we'll reach out to the inventory project just to find it as a two-way street, a courtesy to them and to find out if there's any information they have. Um, and so when I reached out to you, Alec, was there any, were you aware of this work prior, prior to us contacting you? Yeah, thanks, Greg, and hi, everybody, th and thank you uh, for having us to speak about this stuff. Um, I think this was a work, like many Algoma sketches, that we were not aware of uh, prior to receiving word, but that's hardly uh, surprising. We'll talk maybe a little bit later about, you know, existing inventories and stuff like that, but Algoma works in particular, though they often perhaps were cataloged at some point, never were illustrated and certainly weren't uh, photographed early on uh, while Harris was alive or certainly in the 20s when they were made. So works like this that emerge often are yeah, complete surprises about uh, the uh, the subject matter and what they'll look like. But uh, yeah, so we didn't have this one in mind looking for it, but certainly we're happy to see another Algoma sketch uh, emerge. And I mean, how, what are the, some of the key characteristics of the Algoma period say, compared with, um, I guess it would be some of the, maybe the urban scenes sure. just before and what he went into, but what, what's going on in the work and in the mind of, of Harris Stephen at the time? Yeah, right. So, okay, to put Algoma in context, and I, first I should say, um, I'll use a little bit of terminology when talking about this, most people are probably familiar, but we'll talk about these oil on panel works as sketches, which are distinct from pencil okay. sketches or graphite sketches, which often the artist would refer to as notes. So Algoma really comes in, uh, Harris visits it for the first time as the First World War is coming to a, a close. Um, in, in 1918, Harris had lost his brother during the war. And of course, as you know, many Canadians would be familiar with, Tom Thompson also died during the course of the war, though far from it at Canoe Lake in Ontario. Um, so Harris was had gone through a bit of uh, a series of, of personal crises during the war. And Algoma very much was a chance for him to rediscover some of the Canadian landscape that prior to the war, there had been a lot of excitement about depicting through art and paint. So heading out there and sketching in situ, sort of plein air sketching like we see the results of here was a huge part of Algoma. That is a little bit distinct from what he was doing around the same time. So he started going 1918, 1919, um, 20, 21 to Algoma basically. And he would have been painting in Toronto at the same time, but used a lot more pencil sketches in Toronto, likely, uh, just because you don't get quite the same peace and quiet when sketching in the middle of a crowded downtown street as you might get sitting beside the railroad tracks or uh, you know uh, along a lake shore in Algoma. So really, we have very few pencil sketches from Algoma, distinct from urban areas, and then later on in the Rockies and even a Lake Superior, he would use pencil sketches a lot. So Algoma is almost entirely these sort of in the moment, really. Um, lively sketches that are done in one sitting, you know, I'd imagine it probably took him less than an hour to do this, probably was pretty quick uh, sketching like this, um, maybe a little longer if you consider finding a good place to sit and uh, finding an exact subject. But uh, yeah, they, they certainly have that vitality that you, you see in other works, but but is distinct from the austerity that, that later comes in, in Lake Superior. Hmm. And he did, uh, I'm sorry, about five or six trips up to Algoma, was it? And um, how how do you go about sort of dating them? Like, can, you, can you chart some yeah. sort of evolution or progress up there? I, I think, yeah, in total. So we went for the first time in the spring of uh, 1918, uh, along with McCollum to Manitoulin Island, and then just went on to Sault Ste. Marie and sort of got a sense that there could be something in Algoma to paint. So the first sketching trip in earnest was fall of 1918. And 
1918 and 1919, they arranged for a boxcar. Uh, Harris arranged for a boxcar, went with McCollum, with J.H. McDonald, with Frank Johnson, and one of the trips also with A.Y. Jackson. In 20 and uh, 21, they returned as well, uh, but instead of staying in the boxcar, they stayed in some cabins along the ACR, around the, along the Algoma Central Railway. And then I, I believe they went one final trip in the spring of 22. So I think it's a total of, check my math there, but it's something like seven trips to Algoma in total. Unlike other um, periods where I've, I've, we've become a little bit more comfortable working out some rules for when work were done within sort of uh, the range of visits, say to the Rockies or, or to Lake Superior, you know, there's changes in the size of his works, there's changes in subject matter in different areas, certainly in the Rockies. It's a little bit easier to, to get more specific. In Algoma, it, it can be a bit tricky. Um, you get a few hints, say if they if, if one of the artists has written on the back, say Sand Lake or Mongoose Lake, that usually is a little bit later. But a work like this that gives you really very little um, Algoma sketch, it, it, it's pretty hard to narrow it down. It could certainly be from one of the boxcar trips, but it also could have been uh, from some of the explorations around one of the cabins on the ACR in 1920 or 21. Um, hard to say, but I do think that it's in early fall work because you still see a lot of green on the trees, a little bit of, of color, but it's not, uh, it's, it's probably early on in the season for whenever the trip is. There's minimal notation. Is that kind of par for the course at this time for him? Yeah, I'd say definitely. Yeah, you see, yeah, just that minimal, that writing in, in ink there is his own writing. And then you also see that sort of uh, size de designation, which I believe is also his writing, probably designation for a framer or uh, perhaps just to distinguish the boards. But um, yeah, so that's pretty typical. On many works, you might see uh, other writing, a Roman numeral and some categorization. That was a Doris Mills, who was a friend of Bess is uh, Harris's wife in the 30s. Um, she was tasked with sort of cataloging uh, works that had been left behind in the studio building when Lauren Harris and Bess moved to the United States. So you'll often find those notations as well in those numbers, but they weren't done by the artist himself. And there are many works that for one reason or another weren't in the studio building and, and in 1934. And so they weren't cataloged. Uh, okay. And if we can go back and take a look at the front of it, uh, when we see these Algoma sketches, and it seems, it seems like we're, we're deep, deep into nature. Um, as much as you know, how how far away were, was the rail line? How far away was the cabin? Like, were they going miles and miles into nature, or were they maybe a little closer? That's a that's a, a tricky question, particularly with this one. Very little geographic uh, information to go off here. I do think that they were pretty uh, exploratory. Certainly, if the records they have from what Jackson and say Harris did in 1924 in the Rockies, I'm a little bit more familiar with actually, you know, the number of kilometers you might need to hike in a day to get to from point A to point B. There, they were you know, traveling quite a distance sometimes, you know, 20, 30 kilometers in a day easily, I think. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised with the aid of a canoe as well that they were covering considerable ground. And they weren't necessarily doing too many sketches per day. I think you'd probably max out at four or five per day, just based on the notes that Harris would sometimes note, you know, this was five sketches done in one day. And so that seemed to be the exception. So I think they probably spent a fair amount of time exploring and getting to these spot okay. so hard to say specifically but it, it could be quite a ways hmm. okay um let's see um and uh, this one again has that uh generic title of algoma sketch and you're mentioning that on occasion there'll be something a bit more particular like sand lake or uh, Botswana. um does that contribute to our knowledge of, of dating or is there any kind of rhyme or reason to why some are noted, have certain notations and some have others? Um, yeah, the notation, the presence or absence of notations, uh, I don't think there's no good rhyme or reason to it, except for the fact that they really fall off, especially signatures on the recto on the front fall mm -hmm. off after 1924 quite considerably. Um, mm. But the, the titles do help us in the dating, so sort of the inverse of that, uh, because we do know that 
even within a trip, they would take the ACR, say, in Algoma up north and then work their way down. So they weren't working from, say, Sault Ste. Marie and moving up to these different stops. They started furthest away and then they would move down as the color changed. So you can piece together sort of the chronology within a single trip. But so far, and we're still piecing together, you know, all these things and looking for patterns, there doesn't seem to be a discernible, uh, clear distinction as to whether or not he wrote the, the title on the back or labeled it specifically. So, okay. yeah. All right. Um, in, in all this chat, Stu, is there anything, uh, anything on your mind about the works or shall we move on to the to the late Sun North Shore Lake Superior sketch. I think we should move on. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Let's. Um, and so I'll, I'll start off with the same question I asked earlier about uh, whether this was a sketch you knew about, or actually, sorry, when I emailed you, you replied that it was one you, the likes of which you figured was out there, but specifically you didn't. And is that something you can talk about a bit more? Sure, yeah. So this one, in, in contrast to the um, Algoma sketches, which, as I mentioned, I've mentioned a few times, this Mills inventory, which was done in 1934, in addition to a listing of the works, there often were little tiny drawings done of uh, of some of the works that were in the, the studio building. So we do, in some cases, have an expectation of, of works that haven't been found yet or that we haven't seen or haven't seen a photo of. and we don't have a drawing for this one. It gets into a little bit more details that only the works of the larger size were illustrated, but we have none for Algoma, some for Lake Superior that we're sort of expecting to see and awaiting to appear and certainly some for the mountains and et cetera, et cetera. But the other thing that lets us know or that I have in my mind that there might be works out there is certainly when you have a canvas with no related sketch that has emerged yet. Because Harris was very consistent, especially in the, you know, uh, this part of his career in 1819 uh, up until the 30s, that pretty much every canvas had at least one preparatory oil sketch. Sometimes there was the combination of several sketches. Elements were pulled from a couple of them, which other members of the Group of Seven did as well in some examples. Um, but you really have this sense of a missing piece when you have a canvas that doesn't have a found sketch. So certainly there's a related sketch to this in the National Gallery of Canada. And there hasn't yet been you know, that exact, or up until very recently, there hadn't yet been this exact match that has come out. And this isn't an exact match, but it's certainly much closer than any that we've seen before to that canvas in the National Gallery, Afternoon Sun. So this one's called Late Sun. It seems that probably in one day he was doing, or, you know, very close um, to one day, he probably was out on this point of land, which is by Port Monroe, uh, sort of between Marathon and, and Coldwell, where he was sketching in 1923 and possibly in 1924 as well, and piecing together, you know, explorations of this different subject. So it's a subject that I've expected that we're expecting, we had been expecting to see works turn up related to this. And so, yeah, it was, it was a very welcome site, certainly with Monmouth Island right there in the, uh, in sort of the center of the picture, and then the hills of the North Shore receding to the West. So, yeah. Oh, and could we see, uh, I think there, there's another slide that has the, the National Gallery canvas um, beside it. And uh, so I, I don't know if, if Alec, if you're able to sort of quickly, so the National Gallery, an image of the National Gallery canvas is in the center. And if you know, it is over a meter, just slightly over a meter high by almost a meter and a quarter wide while the sketch itself is about 27 by 35 centimeters. So these are not the scale, but um, that the way in which, and Alec, if you can sort of go back to it, the way in which Harris was um, editing, refining, um, synthesizing. Yeah, I, I think that, so Harris goes, there's, as I said before, a few different phases really in the 20s. And so if we just move past Algoma when he's working directly onto board, and then we compare that to say late 20s working in Superior, Lake Superior area, then he develops a lot more pencil sketch 
prior to doing an oil sketch or an oil study and then into canvas. Where we are right here is sort of in between the two. This is early on the sketch, the late sun, the sketch we're talking about today, the oil sketch, is early on in his trips to, to Lake Superior. He switches the use of his boards. Um, Charlie Hill, the, the former curator at the National Gallery, found a great letter that discusses this very specific um, moment in time when Harris switches from using these 10 and a half by 13 and 5 eighths boards to 12 by 15. And that really, I think, also changes. In so that's in 1925. So anything that comes before that is this smaller size, and I think has a lot more in common with the method of working in Algoma. Once he mm -hmm. moves to those 12 by 15, he's still sketching yeah. outside and certainly on the North Shore, but he seems to work in a lot more um, pencil sketches and pencil drawing into his sort of methodology and process. So that's a long way of sort of setting the scene maybe. But for this, what we see in those early 20 works, early 20s works, is Harris doing sketches. And then there is a lot of alteration sometimes, sometimes minimal, sometimes quite dramatic between the oil sketch and, and the canvas. And he would work out these problems or these challenges that he found in the composition often on the canvas. You can see records of that. In this one in the National Gallery, um, there's a very obvious little edit on the top of that center point rock. And if you see this work in person, you can really see the blue of the water uh, just behind that uh, sort of foreground rock there at the very top. So, you know, if, if you happen to go to the National Gallery, you can look out for that. But there are often other edits that you can see in other canvases from this period where entire trees are removed yeah. or clouds have been altered. And Harris would do that, you know, at the same time he was working on the, the picture sometimes, but often sometimes even decades later. So you have a lot of this editing and in particular around this time um, in 1923, 24, 25, he seemed to be doing that quite a bit, taking inspiration from a, a, a panel and working it up into canvas, but maybe altering it. So my suspicion in terms of the connection between these two works is certainly that this sketch would have had a great influence on this canvas. Now, whether or not, I think there's probably of some other sketches out there. You can see the titles of these late sun, afternoon sun, last gleam, this other work from the Tom Thompson gallery that's shown in this image here. He clearly was working through different times of day and getting these different impressions, but I would imagine that he was sort of incorporating the best elements of several of them to come up with the, the canvas that you might see as the end result. And, and is that process uh, something that's kind of distinct to Harris or Harris really um, pursued in a way that his group of seven colleagues didn't, this sense of, of really creating a, a composition that's a synthesis of, and then an entirely new thing in its way. Uh, possibly. I think that there are a few examples of other artists doing it. I think, you know, I believe that the, the, the Jack Pine by Tom Thompson, one of the most famous paintings, has the sky coming from another sketch. There's another Mm -hmm. sketch that has a, a, a sky that's much more similar to the final canvas than um, the initial sketch for the Jack Pine. But there's very clear examples. There's, uh, I mean, unfortunately, I don't have the image, uh, obviously, right now. But <laughs> McDonald did it in, in one of his um, Nova Scotia canvases. And Harris had done it in a few Algoma canvases, one of which was displayed um, in the 1920 inaugural Group of Seven show that canvas in the collection of, I think, Victoria College at the University of Toronto is very much a direct um, comparison of, of or uh, composition that, that takes the foreground from one image and the background from another. So I don't know if it's unique, but it certainly is something that he, that he practiced. And until we see all the sketches, we can't really know what parts were taken from what and, and how much, how many modifications were known, but it is something that he certainly was up to. Okay. And, um, you were talking about Harris's penchant for um, sometimes not leaving things alone and uh, going into things sometimes even decades later. Uh, is that something you can expand on, Stu? Yes. Uh, Harris never really felt any work was complete. He uh, always thought there was room for improvement and uh, really wasn't content with the first whether a sketch or a uh, canvas. And uh, in the family, 
we had a number of his paintings, sketches in our home here in Vancouver. And he would come over for a visit and he would look at the wall and say, oh, I don't like that. And he'd lift it off the wall and he'd take it home. He'd say, it needs fixing up. I'll do a little work on it. <laughs> and uh, never be seen again by us. I don't know, it may show up somewhere else, but uh, they would, anytime he came over, he always went home with something to uh, do a little extra work. So works were constantly being rethought, reworked, revisited. Mm. And uh, I mean, would he elaborate on it ever or? Um... No. No. <laughs> so now the, you, and, now and you the, don't. And, and it was just a one way street out of your house back to his studio. That, that is correct. Back to his oh. home where he worked on it. That's right. It was a one-way street. <laughs> My mother finally got fed up with it happening all the time. And she said, darn it, Dad, would you please paint me something and just leave it? And so he did. He did. A, actually, it was a North Shore sketch. Uh, oh. Actually, it was the painting. So he did one, and then he never touched it again. He left it, and we always had it. Okay. <laughs> but that's the only one. Nothing else was sacred. Nothing else uh, was safe. And um, I mean, how, and do you think that's a, sort of a, a key aspect of his artistic personality that uh, perhaps gets overlooked both, this is a question both to you, Stu, and to you, Alec, that, that kind of both restlessness or, and, and a lack of preciousness or. Uh, I, go ahead. You go ahead, Alec. Okay. Uh, well, I'll say that uh, certainly, I mean, uh, distinct from his colleagues, and this is really where Harris is quite unique um, amongst his peers in the group of seven, but but really amongst Canadian artists in general, I think he was among the most reinvent uh, uh, who, who, among the most persistent in his own reinvention. That Harris was, I don't, I can't speak necessarily to uh, the uniqueness of him touching up stuff. I obviously don't have quite the same familiarity with how much other artists may have done the same thing, though I think that it's pretty common amongst all the group of seven that most of them uh, died owning almost all the works that they had ever done. So I, I would imagine that the temptation was always there for uh, for many of them. But I think that Harris was constantly interested in, um, in change, in, in new exciting avenues. It's my sense, and certainly talking to Stu has... Um, given some clarity in this that, that yes he wasn't precious about his works from the past that he didn't dwell on his achievements in the past you know he appreciated uh where he had been i think and and the trajectory he had been on but i think that he was only interested in looking forward and, and whatever was on the easel next was what was important or whatever was on the easel now was what was important and i think one of the greatest examples of that is just the fact that how cleanly he departed from landscape painting. He moved in 1934 from Toronto with Bess down to the United States and for a few years in New Hampshire did some uh, landscape sketches and a few canvases. But then when he moved to uh, New Mexico in the late 30s and then back to Vancouver in 1940, he really left that almost entirely behind. And there's only two works that I know of from that entirety of, you know, over over three decades of his life, they are actually sort of back to the same spirit as this sketch here in the field, landscape sketches on a small board. So whereas he would touch up stuff and, and revisit ideas, I think certainly never satisfied. He uh, also just the record of his career shows that he was always looking towards the next thing and not preoccupied with these, I think just a little dissatisfied with. Mm -hmm. The persistent and, was, challenge. And, and was there something you were going to add, Stu? No, I think Alec pretty well covered it. He, okay. He generally just always thought uh, he could improve on the past. He was really never content that the work was complete, finished, um, might be out of sight, but it wasn't as soon as he was in, in his view again, he felt he could improve upon it. And I don't think all of the improvements or all of the adjustments were necessarily improvements but uh <laughs> but it didn't stop him from trying he figured he could make it better and uh I guess sometimes he did and sometimes he didn't okay um 
Now, if we could see the, the, the back of Late Sun North Shore Lake Superior, because in contrast to the, the Algoma sketch that's pretty plain, um, this one has a little bit more information. And actually, there was a detail, sorry, just before that, um, where there, there's a distinct title, signed Lauren Harris, not for sale, which might suggest it's extra special. And then there's this, this uh, circle with a cross form in it that appears on, on a number of sketches and that people respond to in, in certain ways. Um, is there anything, is it something you can talk to, Stu? Well, uh, I can't say positively. There's um, lots of theories, lots of guesses. I have my own. Um, which I don't know whether I dreamed up myself or whether I got it from my mother. I certainly didn't get it from Lauren Harris himself. So it's definitely not guaranteed or fact that it's still a theory. But I believe the mark to be a uh, ownership of the board or mm. most of the what uh, examples you have with the uh, cross and the circle um, are on boards that he was used when he was sketching with other artists, like in the boxcar in Algoma region, particularly North Shore Lake Superior as well. And they would all venture out on these trips and they would have obviously a bunch of boards that had been prepared for them before. So I believe this was Harris's way of identifying this board is mine, keep your hands mm -hmm. off. And uh, so it would be simple as that, not something that this is a work to be worked up later uh, or one of the best works. Um, it was just, I think, a way of showing that the board was his. Yeah. And the not for sale, I don't think was an indication that uh, particularly that he felt it was particularly uh, valuable or he wanted to uh, keep it or anything. Uh, very often it just says NFS on it. You may see some boards with just that on it. Right. Um, I can't really say why he would have put it on, but uh, he wasn't overly anxious uh, going out of his way to sell anything. So uh, he liked to be shown, he liked the works to be seen, but he wasn't, he was fortunate not, enough not to need the money. So if it didn't sell, uh, it really didn't make any difference. So I don't know if he thought that might add a little mystique to it, I, I don't really know, but I don't think it's particularly significant. Okay, and, and there were exhibitions, I can't remember if they were included, group of seven exhibitions, but also exhibitions of uh, what were called little picture exhibitions at the Art Gallery of Toronto. And it seemed like sometimes Harris's would have an NFS notation in the catalog or not for sale. And, and might this just serve that purpose as well, that he sent it for exhibition and just wanted it to be clear that for this exhibition, uh, it's, it's not for sale. Just Harris liked promoting other artists, and I think it may be. I, I'm guessing again, uh, saying you can't have this one, but maybe you'd like to have someone else's hmm. buy something else. Um, I, again, that's strictly a guess, but uh, it could be a reason why he would put on there not for sale. Okay. I, th I think maybe if I'll just jump in real quick here, Greg, yeah. on this, because I, I certainly agree, but I just want to back up a few of Stu's comments there. I think the not, on the not for sale thing, I think that um, there's certainly, <laughs> I think it could indicate that it was in an exhibition. Maybe that's why I think also the titling on this suggests that perhaps it had been in an exhibition or was sent out for one of these exhibitions. But uh, Harris also um, didn't seem to abide by the not for sale rule too often. Oh. <laughs> there are plenty of works that that are distributed that we know were were distributed in the 20s or 30s because they weren't in the including this one perhaps because they weren't in the uh, 1934 Mills inventory. They weren't in the studio building sort of left behind. They found mm -hmm. their way out before then. So many of these early works do have a not for sale, but somebody somehow acquired it um, mm -hmm. early on anyway. So. There's a bit of mystery there, but the symbol, just to back up, and part of the reasoning that Stu and I think this symbol, which is often used or talked about as denoting works of a particular quality, part of the reason that the inventory project or one of the ways that the inventory project can be useful is that we're starting to sort of accumulate pictures of versos. And in doing that, I've just, you know, categorized all the works that we have 
that have this symbol on them. And a few patterns emerge. One, one of those patterns is it's not found on any works that are of the larger size, 12 by 15. It's only on works that are this size, which means they're sort of done in between, say, 2016 and uh, 1920, or sorry, 1916 and, and uh, 1924. So you have that sort of period there. Either Harris was using it in some way to signify quality, but why did he stop after 1925? We wouldn't really have a good answer for that. The others, there's a few examples, or certainly many examples of works that have this symbol on the back that were never worked up into any sort of um, canvas, certainly. And in fact, it, it's fairly uncommon that these works necessarily were worked up into you know a larger canvas there doesn't seem to be a discernible pattern there in terms of his favoring one work over the other or whether or not they were exhibited and there are a few works in fact that we know he didn't like that have this symbol because there's one great example in the mcmichael of a board that was entirely scraped off so on the back there's the symbol but on the front it, it the work's been completely um, scraped off and seems to have been done so at the time. So not later on in his career, before the paint was dry, it was all scraped off. There's no title on the back. There's just the symbol, which lends certainly credence to the fact the symbol was put on there before the board was um, painted on. Thanks for that expanded answer. And thanks also for that wonderful segue into the third part of our chat when you mentioned the inventory project and the kind of data that you're collecting. Uh, yeah. In in short, let, uh, just what is it? And and um, yeah, if you could just begin by describing it for people who may be aware of it as a name of a project, but not really sure of what the project's doing. Sure, sure. Um, well, I think it, it, basically what it is is an attempt to catalog as much as possible the works of of Lauren Hare. So this type of overview of the entirety of his career. Um, is an ongoing project. So it doesn't claim to be this definitive or have this goal of being um, at this point, certainly anything that resembles a definitive statement on you know, shutting the door on, these are all the works that Harris did and, and no more, uh, which I'm very thankful for because it's fun to keep discovering new ones. And like these two that I hadn't seen uh, you know, a few months ago, we usually get maybe a dozen a year that are new that we slowly add to this project. So it's an attempt to sort of systematically catalog these works, create this inventory with the goal in the sort of short to medium term of, of starting to make scholarship about this work available, starting to make some of the information and the conclusions that we're able to come to available. And certainly I've had the chance to do that a little bit through talks like this or, or writing essays um, about works, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a wonderful chance to share some of this knowledge, but also just through consultation with galleries or with um you know commercial uh, actors in, in the market but also in, on the institutional side um just doing sort of varying degrees of consultation on works or of putting together links um that's a big part of what we're doing right now it helps us in terms of research and also hopefully it helps to flesh out a, a little bit of the information about Harris's career Eventually, we would like to make all of our findings and all these works and sort of inventory publicly accessible. That's a bit of a more, you know, needs a few more steps to get there. But that is the goal, that there is a lot of, Harris obviously has a, a large profile in Canadian art, and there's a lot of information out there. But it generally is, you know, a, a, a pretty narrow um, picture of his career. There are a lot of works that are reproduced a great deal. And there are a lot of works that people have never seen and that it would be lovely to be able to share that kind of information. So the type of, you know, online resource like the Tom Thompson catalog raisonne that, that's online, that wonderful um, sort of presentation of research, that's the type of thing that we would like to, or that we are working towards to make this, you know, open up opportunities for further research, but also further appreciation of uh, the full range of Harris's works. Now, what sort of stuff did you have to start with in terms of, you mentioned the Mills inventory and how did, because this might be one of those things uh, that some, Harris was painting before there was the sort of common commercial dealer system we know. Um, so did he document his work? Who was doc? Was it documented early on? And then sort of his different moves, you mentioned him going to 
the United States and then moving to Vancouver. And I mean, what did you have to start with and what have you been building on? Uh, well, yeah, when I, uh, you know, sort of connected with Stu, which was about eight years ago, maybe now, um, okay. in 2015, um, Stu was kind enough to share the resources that he had available as, as a starting point, which really are a few limited sources. The main ones being this Doris Mills list from the mid thirties, which cataloged after Harris, uh, Bess and Lauren, after they left for the United States, Harris left more or less all his work behind. Some of it was in storage at the Art Gallery of Toronto, now the Art Gallery of Ontario. Um, some of it, uh, many of it, including most of the sketches, the smaller panels was in the studio building and uh, Harris didn't seem to care. Uh, I, I believe, and maybe Stu can speak to this a little bit more, that mm -hmm. at Bass's Please. behest, um, there was some inventorying done. Stu, do you want to maybe say what you know about that? Yes. There yeah. were, when they left, when Bess and Lauren left to go to New Hampshire, there were a lot of works left behind, some in his home and some of them in studio building. A lot of the ones left in his home, uh, my grandfather wrote to his daughter and said, get rid of them. And so my mother gathered them up and just started passing them all out. So there's quite a few of them out there that were just handed out. I'm only aware of oh, six or eight of them. Uh, only one of them is back in the family. Um, I know a number of them have been sold by people who were recipients of this handout. And then the ones left in the basement in the studio building, he got a notice from whoever was in the studio building at the time saying, hey, Lauren, we need that space under the stairs. Get rid of your works. So he said, fine, burn them. <laughs> and uh, they said, well, that's probably not the best idea. And he said, well, I don't want them, so just get rid of them. So anyway, Bess said, wait a minute, Lauren, maybe I should have a look at them. So she went up to Toronto and she looked at them. And she took most of them, if not all of them, and, and put them in storage there. So those are many of those are the works that we see today, the sketches that survive, the ones that have particularly the Doris Mills um numbers on them they were the ones in the storage and so a lot of them survived best ser uh, saving them otherwise they would have been thrown in the fire he didn't have an awful lot of use for them they'd been done they were passed he was moving on so let's get rid of them hmm. uh, i think needless to say there just very quickly uh, it, Harris, as you might surmise from that type of care that he had for his works, did not keep records of his works himself. So there's the 34 to 36 Mills inventory that we have to refer to. After that, there's really very limited stuff. So some uh, collections that Bess Harris had, of she had 100 works that were her own collection that she sort of built by acquiring them from uh, Lauren somehow over the 40s and 50s. We've got some records there. And then there was uh, LSH Holdings that sort of incorporated in the early 60s that provides us some records of the abstracts. But really, there's no uh, systematic or reliable source that came from Harris himself or or really anybody. So it's sort of it's quite piecemeal what we're putting together. Yeah, that so was the business end of the company of the operation. Hmm. Lauren produced the works. Bess was the one that would sell them, distribute them, um, put them in shows, and so forth. Harris had uh, very little input in that. Or I suppose he had input, but Bess was the deciding factor. And uh, there's a bunch of questions I have, but I also feel we need to be getting to the point of, of questions for our, our audience. Uh, and um, there was one last one about the inventory, but I'll go to, there's a question that we received from one of our attendees who grew up in Sault Ste. Marie and knows Batchewana. And um, curious to know if uh, there are photos of the areas where the sketches were done. And for the life of me, I cannot recall the name of the couple who've been doing some wonderful work. Um, Joni and Gary McGuffin. Thank you, Stu. No problem. <laughs> wonderful people, very knowledgeable. Um, and uh, I'm just looking to see. For other questions. Um, one of the ones uh, is, I think we touched on it a wee bit, but in a, in a really simple way, 
Uh, Harris was pretty good about signing the works. After it seems about the middle teens, not so good about dating the works. Any insight into why he, he didn't so often put a date on the work? Uh, it would be, uh, I try not to assume too much knowledge about motivation. Mm -hmm. in, in general. You can infer a few things. My instinct would be that he did not care at all. And uh, so I think that, you know, it, it has been said certainly that he was not interested in titling the works because he wanted didn't want it, that to interfere with the interpretation. And I think that certainly with the abstracts, he did write about that. He did write about saying, you know, this is, it's an idea from mm -hmm. this creative act and its interpretation. Then, you know, you, you want as few uh, sort of filters between the audience and the work as possible, including titles. I think that whether or not he was signing or writing on the back of, of the panels that were being created. I mean, there's over, we have over 200 Algoma sketches um, in the inventory right now. And there's probably, I would say at least 50 more out there. So a fair number of works. He was coming back from these trips with a lot of works. And I think many of them he would obviously revisit uh, for canvases or for shows, but many of them also just were, you know, experiments they were creative expressions and it wasn't he didn't seem to be particularly concerned with the documentation aspect so i think that's just an you know a uh an exaggeration of that but some of the works that were signed later i, I do believe and Stu can maybe correct me on this or enlighten uh, us further but I, I believe that they perhaps were signed on request they were going to a dealer or somebody's purchasing it can you write your name on it? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, there you go. Here you go. Rep, yeah, that's rep the signatures. Lauren felt the work should speak for itself. You shouldn't be buying the signature. You should be buying the work. So many or most works were not signed. They were definitely signed on request. Uh, Bess, again, being the business end of it, also said, come on, Lauren, you have to sign these things. You have to sign them. So he would sign some of them. And there may be one or two out there that... Uh, best put her hand to. But signatures were not important. He felt the work was important. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Um, I, I, although it's also this big kind of metaphysical question too. Uh, one of the questions that's come in has to do with Harris's supports, particularly the, the, the rigid supports, wood panel, paperboard, um, I mean, physically, they are different things, but is is there is does that also become a a clue for dating? Um, and is what do we know about about them? Yeah, I think okay. So Harris sketched on yeah wood panel, and uh, there are some works. I think early in Algoma that that's what you know. As I said before, dating in Algoma is tricky. And whereas I've figured out, quote unquote, you know, my own set of rules or set of rules for dating stuff in the mountains a little bit more specifically, Algoma is tricky. But one of the things that will certainly help, I think, eventually when I get enough of an analysis going um, is, yeah, he used wooden boards early on. There are more early on works, 18, 19 was painting on wood. Um, and then uh, I think some of the later ones, like I believe both these examples are painted on paperboard or, or fiberboard, really most often or almost always was this brand of board called beaver board, which was used for very quick sort of, you know, almost like drywall. It was primed and ready to paint already because it was used for if you were building a shed or an attic or a cottage, you could put it right up and it was already ready to be painted on, which is perfect for these artists to have it already sort of ready to uh, act as an artistic support. Um, so beaver board, it, uh, without getting into the details of it, I don't have an example right here, but it's, you know, it's very similar to fiber board that you might find today. It, it's strands of wood fiber that have been sort of layered upon one another. It's quite light. It's got a binder in it and it's got sort of beaver board in particular had one side that was smooth and one side that had a bit of texture, which is where they decided they would often paint on. It's quite light and re, but you know, it's, it's somewhere between uh, the strength of a wooden board and, and certainly uh, a little bit less strong than that, but stronger than just cardboard. So mm -hmm. the number one thing about beaver board is that it's a, a huge indicate. It's a huge um, favor for us. History has shone uh 
favor upon us because they stopped making it in the 1930s. It was available not um, all around the world, certainly in northeastern United States and uh, eastern Canada. It was available, but seems to have not been available after about the mid 30s, which is great because um, it's it's a pretty good indicator of legitimacy for for most works. Um, or, or you know, it's it's one of those things that we look for that that adds credence to to a work's authenticity if there's ever question. Because yeah, it wasn't available um, everywhere afterwards, and certainly not in the fifties and sixties. Though you could probably pull it out of some attics um, somewhere. <laughs> and um, and and so the Beaver Board is kind of a proprietary name, like Masonite, and yeah. so it's a a, a, a a sort of a paper board or more like wood fiber board because these terms yeah. get passed around. I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have an example of beaver board, but I, I mean, it's very similar. This is just, you know, this is modern day fiber board. This would be very similar to what that's like. Essentially, wood fibers There's a little bit of a difference between this. I believe paper board had some, you know, proprietary alignment of the, the fibers and these different layers and binders, but it's pretty much like this. It's just, you know, very cheap, inexpensive board. They would often prep it um, sometimes additionally with shellac on the back, maybe to prevent uh, warping. So you see that in some works, um, but it generally would have been ready to go, easy to cut, easy to prepare. And you often can tell on these works, I think you can probably see on the Algoma one, uh, they would bevel the edges a bit there by hand so that it could slide into a, a, a sketch box or into a carrying case. Because all these works are done in oil, right? Oil paint takes a couple of days up to a week to draw to be dry to the touch. So when they were sketching out in Algoma or on the North Shore, you know, you couldn't just toss it, stack them up into a bag. So they would often have to carry them, slot them into their sketch box or into, uh, yeah, sort of a carrying case that had different little places for it. So yeah, it, it, easy to work with, I think is the key thing, light and reasonably durable. Okay. Uh, one of the other questions is, how is the inventory project funded? I, I presume <laughs> love. Yeah, it's not um, funded by love. Yeah, yeah, passion and love. No, this is all. Um, I mean, there's support certainly that uh, sometimes uh, comes our way. So certainly, some of the work that that I get to do in disseminating the results provides right. a little bit of uh, financial support. But generally, the research is just. Um, yeah, entirely uh, on the on the side, apart from my quote unquote real job. We yeah. should say to the viewers, Greg, as well, that uh, finding works, particularly in private collections, is quite difficult. So if anybody knows of a work or has a work, we'd love to see it mm -hmm. and uh, add it to the inventory. It is, of course, totally anonymous. We don't need to know um, who has it or where it is. It mm -hmm. would be nice to know if they had any provenance and a story behind it. Sure. But uh, we'd love to reach out and try to find any additional works out there. And and to be clear, also, uh, you're nonpartisan. The only thing that you're partisan about is Harris's legacy, and that um, that there, there you have no financial stake. No. In the in the works that you are researching. You're just trying to gather data. We're just gathering the information and hopefully being made, have it being made available to any of the, those that are interested. So that's it. There's no uh, ulterior motives. Well, I, um, I, I, that seems like a, almost a perfect summary, and we're just about at time. Um, and I'm just trying to see if there are other other questions um, that are coming up. Um, just one last look for questions. Um, I mean, through the through the course, and Harris has been a part of your life for your entire life, Stu, and Alec a little less so for you. I mean, is is he one of those artists who you can sort of invoke those cliches of? it just keeps getting richer and that there's always sort of sides to him that never really, there's an infinite number of sides. Or... That's right. It, it keeps expanding. And that's uh, 
something I'd like to mention about Alec because I've learned more about Harris's work from Alec than anybody else. There's uh, been some attempts, not really anything like we're doing, but um, likes of uh, Peter Laracy did an awful lot of work for uh, his Light for a Cold Land. So there have been some works and there have been some people gathering, but nothing to the depth or uh, that we're trying to attain. But Alex's information on the works is amazing. And it's been very uh, enlightening to me to uh, find out as much about his work as I have learned from Alec. But uh, that being said, we cannot authenticate any work. Um, we'd like to see it. We'd be happy to make any kind of comments, maybe where it was done or how, the period, whatever. Um, but it's very difficult to uh, actually authenticate, a, piece, authenticate uh, a work, particularly when you can't have it in your hands. So mm -hmm. I would like to make that point. But again, we would like to reach out to everybody or anybody that may know of a work and uh, see if we could uh, help, maybe give you some information, some background. And uh, one of the questions that came in has to do with uh, perhaps Harris's most famous international collector. Have you reached out to Steve Martin as a as a perhaps a source of support, if only uh, moral or if not financial? Um, no, yeah, no. I, I think Steve Steve Martin's a busy guy, and I enjoy his entertainment. I want Steve Martin to. I mean, if he ever was interested in talking more about Harris, but I feel like I love the exhibition that was put together, Idea of North and the book and everything like that, but not the easiest person to just reach out to and be like, hey, big fan of your Harris work. Let's talk that, you know, I feel like he's got accolades for, yeah, um, for, for many things well-deservedly. Um, what I will just, I'll just follow up just really quickly on what Stu was saying about the inventory, because I do think that, you know, that question about funding and, and very generally, this is a work that is, uh, you know, at some point, maybe we'll need to consider how to disseminate the results and that'll require a little bit more support and stuff like that. But what we do right now, the the acqui acquisition of information and sort of the putting together of this is very much driven by interest and in sort of, you know, I my my day job is in academia and is sort of you know this this role of uh, of passionate research is something that is very familiar in that realm as well and sort of being driven by that and we are very excited it's the reward for us is when we get to see new works or certainly for me you get to see new works get new information so if anybody does have works out there that they think we might not have or that they would like to to share with us, even if it's just a picture of the verso, because you know, up to a couple of years ago, um, you know, we have them now a little bit more commonly. But many of the works that were sold, you know, before the last five or, or ten years, we really don't have pictures of that. And it could be very mm -hmm. helpful. Please feel free to reach out, and we're more than happy to share any little bit of information or insight that we might have about a work, because you know, that usually doesn't take too long. And happy to do it. Happy to share. The passion that we have for the works with others that that have the same interest and that have the same uh yeah um, and on so. that note greg we'd like uh, to thank you personally and waddington's for being very helpful for with us and working with us so we're very grateful to you all and uh, appreciate all that you have done to help us oh you're welcome and it'll just become a, a ricocheting thank you fest but you're welcome it's been a pleasure it's been a great deal of fun and uh, uh i th think there was one last question Stu. we can see alex paint own paintings behind him um any any activity on your part as a painter as a definitely visual artist not <laughs> negative <laughs> definitely not uh, there seems to be very little uh talent has passed on both his my mother and his eldest son, Lauren P. Harris, of course, were uh, artists. The youngest son was in a decorative business, so he wasn't actually an artist. But other than that, no, no, uh, no skills or talented passed down. Okay. Oh, well. Um, well, I, I think we are just a minute away or seconds away from the hour. And I think this has been a, just a wonderful hour that zipped along. 
And uh, I mean, if there's any questions that people do have, they, they can, our contact information will come up and we can filter them to you or, or even through, I think, your information that came up for the slide for the inventory project. Uh, my colleague Liz is back on screen and uh, over to you, Liz. Thank you so much, Alec and Stu. Uh, this was really enjoyable and, and very informative. I've learned so much. I'm sure everybody attending has as well. Uh, and thanks, Greg. Uh, this, it's been really, really good. Um, we just want to uh, say thank you for everybody who's attended. I hope you also enjoyed it. Um, we just have one last slide. I just want to repeat the website for the Lauren Harris inventory, which is unsurprisingly called Loris Harris and Lauren Harris inventory.com. There's no S in the, no, there's not Lauren Harris inventory.com. So yeah, that, uh, that call out, if you have anything um, that might be of interest, uh, that will be welcomed. 